All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you uh, for coming to yet another seminar this week. We have a lot of uh, holy cows here today in the... Uh, yeah, holy cows. Yeah. Well, at least he just said cow. I mean, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's like a high school reunion today, so it's great. See all these, you know. Uh, it reminds me of when I got to the Sea Lab in 2000, you know, a day like today, seeing all these, you know, former people. Um, so today we have Rich Aronson. Uh, Rich is very well known to uh, many of us, and this is because he was at the Sea Lab for 14 years from, what is that, 1994 to uh, 2008. And uh, Rich is here in town because he's the uh, keynote speaker for the GSO meeting starting later today. And we thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, have him give a talk and bring us up to speed about all the many cools he does. He's done a lot of work in Antarctica, looking at uh, evolution of invertebrates and uh, climate change and things like that. Uh, he has a number of uh, highly influential papers in top-notch top journals, such as Nature and Science. So, you know, it's always interesting to uh, hear him speak and tell us about the many, the many things he does. So, um, yeah, that picture right there says it all. So, thank you for coming. So, you want, you, you, you want me to start now? What? You want me to start? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sure. So, um, <coughs> so uh, I, this is. Uh, this is uh, mostly a good news scenario, and there's just a, one little drop of bad news. The good news is that this place is thriving, and I'm thrilled to be back. It's just uh, amazing to, to see all the things that are going on here. The bad news is that I'm mic'd, which means I can't use any bad language, and that was half my talk. So, um, so I'm going to just try to soldier on and do the best I can. And uh, what I want to do is just start with a couple of, of kind of obvious things. One obvious and important fact is that the climate is changing, duh. And the other duh is that, that human emissions of carbon are responsible, and that's obviously not controversial in this room, but as you know, there's a peculiarly American uh, um, frontier mentality, uh, keep the government off my back and keep those darn scientists off my back, reason that a lot of people don't want to hear that, but uh, hopefully that's not an issue here. There's an important repercussion to that, um, in addition to, the, to all the physiological stresses that rising temperature and acidifying oceans are putting on a variety of, of, uh, of, of living things, um, the changes in climate are, are also providing opportunities, which is kind of a nice way of saying a bad thing, providing opportunities for biological invasions, because obviously different, uh, different species are... Um, are, are um, seeing their optima, optimal temperature ranges shift at different times, and so things are going to start getting mixed up. So that's an important repercussion. Um, and then I want to start out this talk by telling you about a really interesting and important observation, and that is that ecosystems at the latitudinal extremes are especially vulnerable to climate change. And in particular, it's the biotas that are living in those, in those ecosystems that are feeling the effects of climate change earliest and most dramatically. Why is that? Well, it took me a long time to figure this out. I probably should have thought about this a little harder, but, but this is the reason. If you look at the, the, the seasonal variation in temperatures with latitude, and I'm going to try to... Oh, yeah. So you, 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 those of you who know me know that I'm completely hopeless with technology, so I'm probably going to you know, drop this and have the batteries come out and all that. But if you look at, at the range of temperatures within habitats across latitudes, um, what you see is that in the temperate zone, of course, there's an enormous, enormous range of temperatures throughout the seasons, right? I, mean, you, I grew up in New York. That's in the temperate zone, right? It's really hot in the summertime, really cold in the winter. But if you go to the tropics, let's say, on a coral reef, and again, this is within habitats. This is not across the entire, around the entire globe. Um, within a habitat, this, you roughly are looking at a three or four, maybe five degree temperature range during the course of the year. And likewise, in polar regions, it's even, it's even more narrow. So in McMurdo Station, where I got lucky enough to go diving a long time ago in 1997, the water is minus 1.8 centigrade. Freezing point of seawater is minus 2. The water is minus 1.8 cold. 
And it's like that all year round, basically. So the result of that is that the biotas that have evolved in those, in those different latitudes have different ranges of temperature tolerance. And, and to a rough degree, and this is not a poor generalization, to a rough degree, biotas, assemblages of, of, of organisms that live in these areas are, are stenothermal at the poles and in the tropics and more urethermal in the middle. And so those of you who remember Monty Python, the dinosaur thin at one end, much, much thicker in the middle, and then thin again at the other end. I mean, this is the, the exact kind of scientific version of the same thing. So basically, urethermal organisms, they're, they're, they're living in the temperate zone. They are going to be more, more I don't want to say adaptable, but more adjustable to, to changing thermal conditions as compared to, let's say, a polar, a polar biota that's experiencing a temperature rise. They're stenothermal. Temperature leaks up above where they can tolerate it. It's just not going to be as good for them. And, and it's, again, for this reason that, that basically ecosystems, again, at the latter, latitudinal extremes are especially vulnerable to climate. And it was only a few years ago that I realized that this is the reason that I work on coral reefs and in Antarctica both. And, you know, I was trying to figure out what it was, that, that what the commonality was, why was... I was kind of intellectually attracted to both of those to both of those types of places, and that's the actual reason. So, so that's a good starting point for for where we want to go with this. Now, if you go to Antarctica, the Arctic is warming very rapidly. I don't have time to talk about the Arctic today. I do want to talk about Antarctica. It's also warming very rapidly in Antarctica. And if you look at summertime ocean temperatures, and you look at sea surface temperatures, and then you go down to depth. If you look at the sea surface temperatures, they are going wild off the western side of the Antarctic Peninsula, which is right here. So this is Antarctica, here's the peninsula, that's South America, and this is the famous Drake Passage, the worst place to take a boat on the planet. Um, but it's just going up very rapidly. Summertime, sea surface temperatures have ridden, risen about a degree centigrade over the past 50 years, which is double the global average. And it, it, gets, and it gets attenuated as you, go, as you go down through the water column. So it's getting hot very rapidly in shallow water environments in Antarctica. And the consequences are already pretty apparent. And one bottom-up consequence, you know, we talk about top-down and bottom-up, one consequence of that is that sea ice around the western peninsula is declining, and that means that the diatoms and other algae that grow upside down under the sea ice there are declining, and that means the little baby krill that eat that stuff that's sloughing off the bottom of the sea ice, they're declining, and a daily penguins that eat the krill, you know, like the house that Jack built, um, all the way back, in, they're declining. So this is a, a, a graph from, a, uh, from an article that uh, Jim McClintock from UAB put into American Scientist in 2008, showing the downward trajectory of a daily penguins. These are the, the ones that you know, the ones with the tuxedos, right? So they're going down. This is adult breeding pairs of a daily penguins in a, in a colony near Palmer Station on the Western Peninsula. And they're taking a dive. They started out around 15,000 breeding pairs, and then they're down to about 5,000. And two other species that are warmer weather penguins, the Gentoos and the Chinstraps, they're increasing. They don't depend as much on sea ice. So, so the, these, these penguins are moving further south, and these penguins... They're moving further south, too, but they're coming in to where the Adelies used to be, and they're increasing. But if you look at the scale, it's a much lower scale. So although they're increasing, the total biomass of penguins is, is taking a dive. So, so that's what's going on with these penguins, Adelie penguins. They're moving further and further south. Like a lot of... We, we are expecting a lot of these organisms to move as the climate changes, but they've got a little problem, which is that eventually they're going to bang into a big hard thing, which is the Antarctic continent, and they're not going to be able to go any further south, and you know, we could be looking at, at extinctions down the road, but obviously that's just, just speculation. So that's, that's bottom up, so it's based on productivity. What I want to talk to you mostly about today is top down, and I want to ask some key questions about predation and food webs in Antarctica. And here they are. What's unique about the trophic structure of benthic communities in Antarctica? How did past climate change alter that structure of benthic food webs to produce these unique trophic features? And then finally, how's modern climate change affecting the endemic fauna of Antarctic benthos and its unique trophic structure? 
And the way I want to do this is to try to weave together ecology, paleontology, physiology, and, uh, and, and a bunch of other stuff um, to try to kind of put all this stuff into one kind of coherent, you know, climatology, just try to get it all together and make a coherent story about what has happened in Antarctica and what is going to happen or what we think is going to happen. So I want to start, of course, with this first question, what's unique about the trophic structure of Antarctica? And the, what the, the answer is, is what is unique to start with is that it is a, a, a unique food web in that it's missing an upper trophic level. And that upper trophic level is fast-moving, bone-crushing predators, which is to say Teleostean fishes, Neosalakian sharks and rays, which is to say modern sharks and rays, uh, stingrays, bat rays, uh, nurse sharks, all that kind of stuff, and, and decapod crustaceans, crabs and lobsters, large predatory shell-breaking uh, shell breaking animals. They're just not there. And I say that they're modern shell-crusting predators, and by modern, I mean, I've got the asterisk here, that is to say that they are the product of post-Paleozoic diversification. So these three groups, the bony fish, the modern cartilaginous fish, and these, these predatory decapods, stomatopods, a lot of these animals, they all diversified explosively beginning after the Jurassic period. So well into the Mesozoic, well after the Paleozoic. And that has, has huge consequences. It all happened at the same time. And we'll talk about this. This is going to be one of the threads that runs right through everything that we, that we talk about. Those predators structure modern benthic communities everywhere in the world, including the Arctic, except for Antarctica. And in Antarctica, there are no lobsters or crabs that are running around crushing sea urchins and clams and stuff like that. There are no sharks and rays. There are a few skates running around in deep water. There are very few of them, and they're very low diversity, both. And, and they, they, they're not particularly important ecologically. The teleostean fish that live in shelf environments, continental shelf environments, like you know what you study around here, are the notothenioids. Those are the antifreeze fish. They have these antifreeze glycoproteins in their blood. It works just like antifreeze in your car, which you wouldn't know about. You live on the Gulf Coast, right? Little haha -ha there, right? Um, keeps ice crystals from forming in your car. Same thing. These, these antifreeze glycoproteins keep ice crystals from forming in their blood and, and, and so that they don't die when, it's, when they're in sub-freezing waters. But they're also... They, they can't crush hard things. They eat soft foods. And if you look at their teeth, histologically, they're loose. They're just kind of wiggling around loosely. They're just kind of, kind of loosely floating in their gums. And, and they're not cemented into their jaws. And so they've got loose teeth. They can't crush hard shell prey. And mostly they chow on amphipods and, and isopods and little shrimps and things that, that, that float around near the bottom. So, so there are no modern, that is to say, post-Paleozoic shell-crushing predators in the Antarctic shelf. So an evolutionary consequence of this comes straight out of Gary Vermeer in, in his wonderful book in 1978, Biogeography and Adaptation. Still a great book, highly speculative. A lot of it's wrong. Fabulous book nonetheless. Uh, and everybody should read it. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's a really important book. But anyway, if you look at seashells along a latitudinal gradient, what do you find? Well, Tropical shells are spiny and, uh, and have all kinds of doodads on them. And that's less the case in the temperate zone and definitely not the case in, in, in Antarctica. Shells are thin and not very uh, uh, architecturally festooned or whatever you want to say in, in the poles, but, but very much so in the tropics. And all of these architectural features have been interpreted as anti-predatory adaptations. So, so these big keels this very narrow aperture, which is, of course, the animals living right in here in this helmet shell. Same thing with this cone shell. Lack of a spire, which is the, the, you know, the, the, the top of the shell, so, they, so a crab can come along and snap it off because it's not there. Um, and then these, uh, these, all these spines, these have all been interpreted as, as anti-predatory adaptations, and they're very well expressed in the tropics and, and, and less so as you, move, as you move north or south to higher latitudes. And the inferred latitudinal gradients, of course, are increasing predation pressure as you move to the tropics. But if you go from the tropics to the poles, we think 
that calcification is becoming more costly. And I say we think because there's a lot of controversy about, about it right now. It's definitely the case that if, if, the, if the ocean chemistry is right and it's warm enough and you're shallow enough, like when you're flying over the Bahamas and there's a lot of evaporation, you can get spontaneous precipitation of calcium carbonate. That's what these, all those ooey shoals are uh, if you go into the, into the exhumants in the Bahamas. And, and that's certainly less the case as you move north. So we think that there's a greater cost in ATP for organisms that are shell building as you move from the tropics out to the poles. So that's, that's an, an evolutionary consequence, but there are, are a ton of ecological consequences as well. And those revolve primarily, again, around the fact that those modern, fast-moving, bone-crushing predators are not there. And so what I want to do is take you to McMurdo Station, uh, where I had the privilege of going diving with Jim McClintock and, and his group uh, a long time ago. So we're well within the Antarctic Circle, way up here at about 70 south or something like that, or 69 south. Uh, there's the Antarctic Peninsula, so South America's here, and Australia's there, New Zealand's over there. And, uh, you know, it's bitchin' cold there. I mean, so I've already said a bad word into the mic, but, um, but uh, it's not the worst word I had in mind. But, but, um, but anyway, so there I am. Uh, freezing pretty, pretty, pretty badly. This is the, here I am in my dry suit. It's just to certify that I really did go diving in Antarctica. You'll notice the old Nikonos and close-up kit there with which I got these unbelievable pictures I'm going to show you next. But uh, basically, they go out, they take a gigantic drill, they drill a hole in there, and uh, they put a shot line down there with checkered flags. You can see it. visibility is about 500 feet. You jump in the hole and try not to screw up because if you screw up, you're going to die. And so... So you just go down, you go diving. It's very, very cold, or you can dive in ice cracks. There's all kinds of things you do. And this dark stuff around here is, is ice algae. It's growing, growing under the ice. So pretty interesting. So you climb in and out, and you do your thing. And just, just so you know, if you're ever worried about logistics, two dives, eight-hour affair to do two half-hour dives in Antarctica. At least it was when I was there. So this is what you see when you go to the bottom, about 120 feet. It is absolutely gorgeous. All the top predators there are slow-moving invertebrates of a Paleozoic functional grade. I can read it on the slide yourself. So starfish are amongst the top predators there. Starfish diversified in the Paleozoic, and although some changes happen in the Mesozoic, some evolutionary changes happen, happen in the Mesozoic, the, their basic function has remained roughly the same since, since the Paleozoic and all the way through. So I would call them predators of, of, a, of a Paleozoic functional grade. So that's one top predator there. Another one are these ooey worms. These are nemertians. They're ribbon worms. They're gigantic. They're about this big, huge things with, with slime on them. And if you put the, well, I don't know why you would do this, but if you put them on your dry suit, they, they make a scar. It's like pH of two, so you can write your name on your suit. I don't know why you would do it, but uh, somebody tried it once. But they're, they're, they're big predators. They're, again, they're, they're presumed Paleozoic, um, paleozoic um, features that, that haven't changed much, although, of course, they're mushy, so there's, there's basically zero fossil greater than. And then there are these things, pycnogonids. Um, if you've ever seen a pycnogonid in, in the real world outside of Antarctica, they're, they're about the size of your pinky nail. And these things are about like this. They're these gigantic things. And they run around and they eat uh, the polyps of hydroids and, 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 and uh, colonial ascidians and, and things like that. So, so these are the predators. And if you look at what one would, I think, could legitimately label the ecological consequences of of the lack of bone crushing predators, what do you see? Well, you see that the bottom is dominated by epithelial suspension feeders in soft sediment habitats, which, by the way, looks a heck of a lot like the Paleozoic. So we don't have any Mesozoic predators, and we have Paleozoic predators. And look at that. You look at the bottom, it's very reminiscent of Paleozoic shallow seas. And here's another beautiful shot. Here's one of these few fish. This is one of these antifreeze fish. And they are my favorite invertebrates, the brittle stars. And they're all tooling around, and they're not afraid. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if they were afraid, they'd be running in, all running off in opposite directions, going, oh, and a word that I can't say into the mic. Um, but, uh, but here they are totally unconcerned, which is telling you something about what this fish is doing. It's not eating brittle stars. It's they, they snap at, at amphipods as best they can when they're moving slowly in such a cold environment. The other thing that looks awfully Paleozoic about this place is that it's loaded down with brachiopods. Now, you do not see big clusters of brachiopods most of the time. There are a few places in North America where you will see this, and there are some places in South America where you see this, 
but they are all over the place in certain parts of Antarctica. Again, it's a rather Paleozoic sort of a scene. So if you look at fossils from the Paleozoic, it's all about epifaunal suspension features. So this is a beautiful block from the Smithsonian. These are crinoids and cystoids and a few other things. These are some brittle stars from Japan. And then this is a, a piece of rock that I picked up in a quarry in Illinois <coughs> a number of years ago, and it's loaded with brachiopods. And brachiopods are, in fact, the most common fossils in the Paleozoic. So, as I say to my students at Florida Tech, if you're at a cocktail party, and I don't know why you would be at a cocktail party, but somebody who comes and says, hey, guess what? I've got a fossil in my hand behind my back. Can you guess what it is? I would guess a brachiopod because they're the most common fossils out there. The other thing that you're going to see uh, in this this particular block is these little trilobites. And trilobites, another very good Paleozoic feature, and the crowning, kind of crowning glory of the kind of Paleozoic aspect of these Antarctic communities is this thing. This is an isopod. It looks exactly like a trilobite. Exactly. It does what we think trilobites did. It's a shallow deposit feeder, scrapes off the, the, the top couple of millimeters of organic scuzz from the bottom, kind of like what a horseshoe crab does today. That's a, that's a, a real trilobite. So it's not a trilobite, it's an isopod, but functionally speaking, it does what a trilobite does. And so, so you know, the, I mean, you almost think the Paleozoic picture is, is, is getting more and more complete here. These are Paleozoic type communities. And if you want to see other retrograde communities around the world, to my mind, the best place to go is into the deep sea, where we, we have this idea that the, the relics of times past, you know, all these living fossils like the Nautilus are, are kind of crammed down there. Well, there's an actual actual scientific and factual basis. It's true. And, and one of the things that you see down there are stalked crinoids, like these ones from the Bahamas that Dave Pawson photographed many years ago. Or this thing that I shot from the, um, from the Johnson Sea Link years ago off Cape Hatteras. Lots and lots of brittle stars. This is, these are Paleozoic type communities living in the modern deep sea. Why is that? Because predation pressure is, is depressed there. There are some shallow areas around the world where you can see the same kinds of communities. This is, this is off the coast of Britain. This is off the Isle of Man. This is in Scotland. These are pretty brittle stars. And the colors mean absolutely nothing because they're all like that and there's no light and they're all gray. But, uh, but here's a starfish moving through one of these uh, one of these populations, they're all scrambling to get out of the way because starfish have BO and they know a predator's coming and they, they run away. So, so that's the kind of predatory regime that you see in these, in these Paleozoic type or Paleozoically flavored retrograde sorts of communities. Well, brachiopods. They're a little bit difficult and a little bit more conceptually problematic. Here's a clump of brachiopods. This is from Argentina. There are actually a lot of brachiopods in shallow water environments on the planet today, except they, almost all of them are in the southern hemisphere. And I don't know why that is. There are also some weird Paleozoic-looking bryozoans off the coast of Western Australia. There's some weird, there's something weird going on in the southern hemisphere. But in general, brachiopods appear to be resistant to predation. They have shells. Apparently, they taste like crap, and, uh, and they're rare, but they're more common in the southern hemisphere. So forever after in this talk, whenever I say Antarctica, think to yourself, maybe what Rich doesn't mean is Antarctica, maybe he means the southern hemisphere. So what I'm talking about could be all about the southern hemisphere more so than just about Antarctica per se. I don't know the answer to that. That is somebody else's life's work, not, not mine, but I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting question. Okay, so Paleozoic style communities in Antarctica, at least, again, modern shell crushing or durophagus predators are absent. Sea stars and other slow moving invertebrates, Paleozoic type predators are the top predators. And the bottom is populated by epiphyllal suspension feeders and poorly defended mollusks, which we all talked about. Characteristic of Paleozoic communities and deep sea communities. So, deep sea, Paleozoic, Antarctica all have these, these similarities. This is the, the kind of analogy I'm trying to. To put together. All right, so how did this all get started? Well, that's the next part of this talk, and I want to just refamiliarize you very quickly with um, the geologic time scale. It's divided up into eons. We're in the Phanerozoic eon. That's when, when life as we know it uh, evolved. 
and then that's divided into eras, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, and that's divided into periods, and the periods are divided into stages, uh, into epochs, and epochs and stages, and so on down the line. That's not that important, but this is the Paleozoic when, you know, when, when epifaunal suspension feeders and starfish predators ruled, and when trilobites were nibbling around and doing whatever trilobites did. And this is the modern Antarctic. And again, I'm trying to draw an analogy between the two of these, but my question to you now is, how did that get started? Well, the where, when it got started actually was right around here, around 40 million years ago or so in the Eocene epoch of what's now called the Paleogene period. And by the way, if you ever wanted to know why where these words tertiary and quaternary came from, the reason they're called that is that initially the Paleozoic was the primary, Mesozoic was the secondary, and then the tertiary and quaternary. So that's where those go. I just found that out from a while ago. So I'm just excited. I want to tell everybody about it. But um, anyway, so when, how did this all get started? Well, there's one place you can find out the origin of these weird Paleozoic flavored communities in Antarctica, and that's up here at Seymour Island. And, and while I was at the Sea Lab, the first thing I did when I was when I arrived at the Sea Lab after I got settled in one of those houses um, was was I ran off to Antarctica, which is again the wonderful thing about the Sea Lab. You can do whatever you want, you know, and, and, and you should you should seriously you should relish that because the freedom that you have here is, is a heck of a lot more than than at a lot of places. And uh, um, so I got to go to Seymour Island, which is the best place to collect fossils in Antarctica, and it happens to cover exactly the time when things started to change in Antarctica and the, the long slide to the kinds of communities that we see on the bottom today. So we didn't even know that when we first started going there. We were just going to fool around with some brittle stars in the fossil record. So it's right here. This is the Western Peninsula. This is the Weddell Sea. It's much colder here than it is on this side. There's this little island. Here's what the island looks like. It's right over there. It's in the snow shadow of the peninsula, which means that warm, moist air comes from southern South America, goes across the mountains of the peninsula, snow dumps down, and, and here's the snow shadow. It's a gigantic pile of dirt, and that's kind of what it looks like. There's nothing living there. It's a big pile of dirt. It's in a snow shadow. There's not a lot of snow, and it is loaded with fossils, and you just carry your backpack along and rolls of toilet paper and bags and you just go skipping along the outcrop, la 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 la, like that. You probably don't want to do that. But you, you pick up fossils, you wrap them in toilet paper and heave them into your pack and then go staggering back home. And it's, it's just an amazing place to collect fossils. <coughs> and there are two parts to this island. There's this part, which is all Cretaceous and has those boring old giant ammonites about this big. And then all the interesting stuff, the fossil brittle stars and the little tiny moths are all the way up here in this Eocene section. And this is a plateau where the Argentines have got an air base where we stay. So this is the La Meseta formation. It's an Eocene formation. This is what it looks like. Uh, that's Ryan Moody, who used to teach here. Joanne, other half. And, uh, and this is a, one of the campsites that we had in Antarctica. You can see the incredible topography here. And uh, it's basically, it is interpreted as a channel, submarine channel, that got filled in with sediment and at some point some sort of tectonic event picked it up and, and lifted it up, you know, made it subaerial, and then erosion has exposed all of these fossils. And so one of the things that's really interesting about the place is that if you go to the bottom of this formation, this La Meseta formation, because like down in that dip down there, um, you're going to find a lot of petrified wood which is really interesting. And what's really cool about that petrified wood is that it's the same stuff as grows in Tierra del Fuego and in the mountains in New Zealand today. It's Notophagus, the southern beach. And what that's telling you is that at that time, it was essentially a cool temperate environment on the Antarctic Peninsula at the beginning of the Eocene. Well, that makes sense because it was a greenhouse world. It was very warm at the beginning of the Eocene all around the world, and that's true in Antarctica as well. And shot through the formation are what you might expect from Cenozoic fossil record, which is to say clams and snails, mostly clams. There are a lot of clams, fossil clams in this formation. This entire field is full of all these clams, billions of these things. So lots of clams, exactly what you expect. Cenozoic is a gastropod and bivalve dominated fossil record. So totally sensible. But then there's some weird stuff going on. 
One thing is that there are these piles of brachiopods. These little pumpkin seed things are brachiopods. They're modern, um, relatively modern species. They're not like the, whoops, not like the Paleozoic ones, but there they are in these piles. So just think about that. That's kind of giving you a little Paleozoic whiff. And then there are these things. These are blocks of rock that are just completely plastered with fossil brittle stars. And if you look at them carefully in their lithological context and take a close look at them under the microscope, it seems pretty clear that these things represented dense populations that were smothered by by sedimentation events and buried in place rather than being balled up and rolled off somewhere and dropped in a hole. And basically, the short reason for that is that these things fall apart extremely quickly when they die. And so the fact that they're just lying there, splatted out, they're a little busted up, but they're, they're not completely hashed in, in to, to make what's called an ophiolite, which is a rock made out of the ossicles of, of brittle stars. So these are pretty clearly preserved in place or at, at most transported a short distance. So we interpret these things as fossil dense populations of brittle stars. Same thing goes for crinoids. These are stalked crinoids in a shallow water environment, but they're from the Cenozoic. These things should have been out of shallow water by Cretaceous time. So, so by, by, let's say, 70 million years ago, these things should have been out of shallow water. Here it is around 35, 40 million years ago. Poof, there they are. So, so again, it's this kind of weird retrograde or anachronistic flavor to the whole thing. And if you're interested in, in, in paleoecology, you might want to try to ask a question, well, could you say something about predation pressure on these animals? And, and, and uh, the best you can do, and it's pretty good, is to count up the number of sublethal injuries that these brittle stars have. So basically, you see, how many brittle stars do I have here? What proportion of them have got one or more arms that are regenerating? So obviously, this is a brittle star, uh, clearly, this isn't because I broke the arms. It's not a break. This is something that was going on when I collected this brittle star. Same thing with this one. And then you can see that in the fossil record as well. I had to make, believe it or not, make a day trip to, to Iowa to take a look at this enormous multi-ton block of, of fossil brittle stars. And I found this one little dude with the, with, the, with the regenerating arm. Same thing goes for crinoids. This is Tatsuo Oji's work from the, uh, from the University of Tokyo. You find these regenerating arms. The arms of, of crinoids are a little bit more complicated, but the bottom line is that if you look at the proportion of brittle stars regenerating arms in these Antarctic populations, it's extremely low. A lot lower than in modern low predation brittle star populations, and certainly a lot lower than modern populations living in high predation, um, high predation environments. So, so that makes a lot of sense, suggests that the encounter rate between predators and prey in these dense brittle star populations was pretty low. Same thing goes for the crinoids. Um, I hope you don't mind if I speak a little faster now because I'm starting to run out of time. But uh, th that's a joke. You know, you can laugh, you know. So, um, so anyway, if you look at this again, the, the proportion of regenerations in fossil crinoids are even lower than a deep water low predation population from Japan. So, so these are low predation populations. The question is, if you go, in, go in, into the fossil record of Antarctica, how do those low predation populations distribute themselves through geologic time? Where do you find them and where don't you find them? Well, Linda Ivany, an uh, old friend who's a geochemist as well as a, a paleontologist, um, put together this beautiful chronology for us based on, based on isotopes and, then, and, and gave us a temperature curve and this is what it looks like. This is at least the first cut. And it shows the early Eocene climatic optimum. This is petrified wood time, or they were trees at the time. And then there's a big section missing. And then there's this MECO, the mid-Eocene climatic optimum. And then temperature just takes an incredible dive. It just goes down very rapidly, and especially around 41, 42 million years ago. Okay? And that's going to be a real key, because if you look at this as, oops, if you look at this as a break point, you can start to, 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 to look at events happening around here. It's at this point that the Drake Passage opens up. That is to say, the separation, I guess it's raining out, the separation between South America and Antarctica. So the water's whipping around there. That is the time that Antarctica becomes climatically isolated from the rest of the world and the gradient in temperature from the equator to the pole 
is set up and becomes very strong and very well maintained. And then, so there's Middle Eocene, oops, I'm so sorry. There's Middle Eocene cooling there, and then up here, glaciation starts at the beginning of the Oligocene. So the section covers 55 to about 34 million years ago. <coughs> years ago, there's this big event 40 to 42 million years ago, and then there's another big event up here after this formation is done with, and that's permanent glaciation. Well, it's a very easy story. If you look at, at where these fossil brittle stars and two types of crinoids occur, they all occur, if you look at them stratigraphically, they're all above the cooling event. That's kind of interesting. So that makes total sense. A very easy story. Don't have to worry about that. If you look at the brachiopods, these little nests of brachiopods, they're piles of brachiopods lying all around Seymour Island, where they used to be until I collected them all. But, but they, they were all over the place. And if you look at them, they show up both below and above that cooling event. So the brachiopods don't seem to be caring much about whether it's cool or warm. They show up equally above and below. But the echinoderms, they're all above that cooling event. And if you do a G test, it comes out super significant, which, doesn't, which basically means that the distributions of these echinoderms are different from the distributions of the brachiopods. Right? That's what that G test is telling you. And so... What could have been happening? Well, we know that these are, these are low, that, that at least crinoids and brittle stars require low levels of predation. And so what we believe is happening is that crabs, and a lot of them actually were portunate crabs. You can see them in the fossil record. So like the blue crab, they seem to have been inactivated or deactivated by cold temperatures. And there's actually going to turn out to be a good physiological reason for that. And then sometime after, they went extinct in Antarctica. And they've only come back a couple of times at, at, during warm periods. You see these crabs coming back in a little bit. So that's what we think has been going on. If you look at the morphology of the gastropods from the same formation, again, before 41 million years ago and after 41 million years ago, before when we think predation was heavy, gastropod morphology was quite variable and they were very heavily defended against predation. Afterwards, it's not very variable at all, and they're much less defended. So that goes along very well with the idea that predation is slacking off from before when it's warm to after when it's cold. And we know the crabs remained there after the cooling event, but it looks like they must have been, been much less active. So basically that's what this is saying. Dense chronoid populations as predation pressure goes down, and undefended gastropods show up, and the brachiopods don't notice this. They don't seem to, to, this doesn't seem to have an impact on them, possibly, again, because they're less vulnerable to predation, which might explain why there are brachiopods all over the southern hemisphere in shallow water environments. They go to the intertidal in New Zealand or the fjords in New Zealand or you go into the peninsula of Valdez in Argentina. There are brachiopods all over the place. So that's, you know, that maybe that's what's going on. They don't taste, but what it doesn't explain is why there are so many more brachiopods in the southern hemisphere than there are in the northern hemisphere. And again, I don't know the reason for that. There's some, some ideas. But anyway, this is just a summary of everything that happened in Seymour Island, that, that island, across this cold barrier. This is the first pulse of cold water in Antarctica, leading again to the current polar environment. And this is, these are all the changes that, that I've been able to glean from my own work and from the literature. So here's, here are snails getting less spiny. Here are southern beaches going away. Fish seem to become less active, maybe, and go extinct. There are definitely fewer remains of sharks from, from before to after. And then this is the scenario I was trying to build for you about predators becoming, uh, predatory crabs becoming less active. It's possible that the notothenioids, which are those antifreeze fish that don't crush shells, it's possible that they began radiating in Antarctica at that time. We're not totally sure that. And then penguins show up above. They're not below, but you find bits of penguins above. So there's all this stuff going on. And so now what I want to do is talk to you about how climate change might affect the endemic fauna of the benthos and its unique trophic structure. We know what it, what's weird about it. We know why it happened, cooling temperatures, and now what's going to happen as the climate changes. Well, in the modern, there are no shell-crushing predators and there are no shell-crushing no shell fish, no shell-crushing crabs. 
general physiological consideration is it is hard to move around when it's cold. Everybody knows that, right? It's hard to move around. Enzymes work more slowly. Muscles work more slowly. The power output of fish muscle goes down dramatically as you move from room temperature, 25C, down to zero. Okay? So it goes down by 90%. So it's really hard to move around. That's one thing. Calcification, again, we think it's costly at low temperatures, so that means it's hard to build strong bones and teeth, as they used to say, you know, uh, for Wonder Bread or whatever it was. And, uh, and uh, so shelf-crushing apparatus is reduced, as, is the, the, as are the architectural defenses of the prey. But it's an accident of history. This is just, it's, there's nothing deep or fascinating. It's just, it was just an accident of history. Because these fish, the reason they don't crush shells, there's, there's no reason for it. It's just, this is the way it worked out. So if you go to the Arctic and you look at winter flounder and a couple other fish, they have these same proteins, antifreeze proteins, but they're shell crushers. And they evolved those proteins convergently with the Antarctic notothenioids. So there's no reason, there's nothing about making those proteins that makes you less likely to crush shells. It just worked out that way. That's, that's it. Historical accident. Okay, another weird historical accident. The reason that there are no crabs and lobsters there is because they can't flush magnesium out of their blood. And this is a really odd story. So everybody knows that magnesium is a narcotic. Maybe you didn't know that. But if you've ever used Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate, to knock out invertebrates or anything else, you'll know magnesium is a, a narcotic. Now you can get Epsom salts at CVS, and you don't buy them. I'm sure that they don't have stacks and stacks of mag sulfate in, in CVS because there are a lot of invertebrate zoologists out there. The reason that they have it there is because if your feet hurt and you want to soak them in hot water and you put mag sulfate in there, it, it's a narcotic. It's also used against constipation for a very similar thing. just knocks out your gut. And, and so, so magnesium is a narcotic, is the main point. Crabs, king crabs and lobsters, they cannot, this is the, the concentration of magnesium ions in seawater, they can flush out these ions to some degree, but not a lot. And at very low temperatures, the combined narcotic effect of the magnesium on the one hand and the cold temperatures on the other hand, it kills them. And that's why there are no crabs in Antarctica right now. Because of magnesium. Krill, shrimp, and amphipods, they can flush the stuff out, and they're fine. And, you know, krill, are, of course, are all over the place in Antarctica. Amphipods, they're all over the place. And, and, and shrimp, there are lots of these things running around Antarctica. But you will not see lobsters or crabs or king crabs until what's coming next. So there's not especially more magnesium in Antarctica the same amount as everywhere else. It's just that when it's cold and you're a crab and you're incompetent to get this magnesium out, you're going to fall over and die. Okay, so now I need to tell you something about oceanography. I promised oceanography. Here's oceanography. This is the circum-Antarctic current. Antarctic circumpolar current runs around like this called the west wind drift. And if you look at, at it, it used to be considered a barrier for uh, a barrier to dispersal from the rest of the world. And if you look at it, it's, it looks like Swiss cheese, just like the Gulf Stream and every other big current on the planet. And there's a particularly an area of, of very um, enthusiastic, <laughs> exuberant eddy formation right between South America and Antarctica. And it's not, not very surprising if you look at the, at the physiography, excuse me, and uh, there are a lot of eddies forming, so cold core eddies are coming down. I mean, warm core eddies are coming down. Cold core eddies are going up. And the result of this is that crab larvae are able to get in. And so in 2002, um, trawling found the first, you know, first obvious larvae. This is an anamura larva, so it was a, it's a hermit crab type thing. And this is a break urine crab larva. These animals are coming in in these cold core, in these warm core rings from southern South America, the South Atlantic, and what's happening, eventually those rings are, are dissipating, and because of this magnesium issue, they're freezing to death. Okay? So they're not making it now. But it's getting warm, right? So, so there may be a time 
when, when they're, they're, they're not going to freeze to death. And in fact, as it gets warmer, you would expect these larvae to not only to be able to survive because it's warm, but also if the phytoplankton growing season expands, then there may be some synchrony between development time and, and, uh, you know, and the phytoplankton season, and you could have crabs coming in. So that's what's happening up top. What's happening down below in the deep sea? Have adult, have adult crabs arrived? It would be a pretty stupid question to ask if the answer was no, because then we wouldn't have to listen to the rest of the talk. Yes, they have. There are king crabs. They're living on the continental slope. There are several species of them. They're all over the place. And they're typically, as I say, on the slope uh, uh, deeper than 1,000 meters. And the reason for this has to do, again, with the magnesium story, which is, which is why I told you that story. So this is a temperature profile from the British Antarctic Survey from southern South America over here down to the Antarctic Peninsula over here. Warm, warm, warm. Lukewarm, 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 cool, cool. Really, really cold up here. Why is that? Because the ice is melting and, and cooling off the water. If you look at the Antarctic circumpolar current, there's, there's a part of it called, called the polar convergence. Water is downwelling. So warm water from the, from the South Pacific is, is mixing with cold Antarctic water. They're, it's downwelling and it's traveling south and then splashing up, upwelling off the continental slope in Antarctica. So this is what it looks like, roughly. It's obviously a cartoon. And these crabs, they're here, and they're on the seamount, just dipping up above where they can manage with this magnesium issue they have. And somehow, some of them made it over here, where it's also a little bit warmer, about a degree centigrade warmer than it is way up top here. So they're sitting there, and we got lucky enough to get funding. We've had a lot of good funding from NSF to go and explore this. We towed this camera vehicle called the Sea Sled along the bottom. We started out with a joint Swedish-U.S. expedition and took this track around filming the continental slope all along, all along the place. This is Marguerite Bay over here. We set up a, a study area here. This is the bathymetry as we know it from Marguerite Bay. And the reason is because we filled in almost all of this ourselves while we were doing the project. Which just tells you something about how poorly explored this whole area is. There's not much, not much known about it. We did a bunch of transects with this camera, and well, what did we find? We covered a fair bit of the seafloor by, by a 100 kilometer line in this enormous place. You consider that a lot? Obviously, it's not a lot. It's just a, a little tiny, tiny little scratch. But what we found was these crabs were all over the place. Lots, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of them in this small area that we surveyed. Whoops. And there they are. It's, a, it's a, 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 a king crab. They're about this big or so. Not, you know, not big enough to be world's deadliest catch or, or whatever it is. But, but there are a lot of them there. They're running around on these glacial drop stones. They have this very kind of crushy, kind of lobstery crushing claw. And what else are they doing? Well, they're doing it. That is to say, they're mating. They're molting. Females need to molt in order to, to receive spermatophores from the males. This is pretty typical, as you probably know from blue crabs, the, the male carries the female around until she molts, donates sperm, and then bye-bye now once, once the carapace hardens. So, and then we found juveniles, and for whatever weird reason, juveniles were all sitting on top of starfish. I, you know, there's a lot to, to, that we don't understand about what's going on here. What else is down there? Lots of good resources. These are brittle stars. It's one of their favorite foods, also one of my favorite animals. Happy coincidence. There are lots of snails there. There are all kinds of starfish and invertebrates. Also, think these king crabs, they're generalized predators of invertebrates. They eat all kinds of stuff, including brittle stars. And if you look at the distribution of brittle stars and king crabs, it looks kind of funny. So these, these are the king crabs, the red bars, and these are the brittle stars. Now, I have no idea what's going on up here, but you know, you're very tempted to say, okay, well, there are, where there are a lot of king crabs, there are not a lot of brittle stars. I, I would really hesitate to, to say, well, that's because they're eating them. I mean, obviously, that's what I think is going on. But, but we don't know that. We don't know that. But it's pretty interesting that other places, the same kinds of things, same kind of, of, kind of disjoint or disjunct uh, d depth distributions have been observed. So, so, you know, that may be what's going on. If you, look, if you look at this in a different way, what you can at least say for sure is that if these crabs were to expand shoreward as the temperature rises and magnesium becomes 
less of an issue that there would be prey resources available. At least, I mean, that much you can say. I think that's, that's a reasonable thing to say. Well, in 2013, we went back and set up another site off Danvers Island, which is, which is uh, this thing over here. That's where Palmer Station is. I've got a crew coming back right now. They're, they're en route, puking their guts out in the Drake Passage, which is the worst place to take a boat on the planet. And, uh, and uh, they've, they've done some more work down here and found a lot more crabs. But it's pretty interesting in this site, same basic densities of king crabs. And there apparently are, if you look at temperature and salinity and all these other factors, there appears to be no reason why these crabs have to stay on the continental slope, why they can't go up onto the shelf. And we know that they're at a minimum depth of like 840 meters. I think they just found one that was even shallower. So they, they may be creeping up. This may be what's going on right now. We don't know how long they've been there. That's a job for genetics, and we're starting to get into that too. What's the population bottleneck? The closest population you know, that, that's legitimate non-Antarctic is in South Georgia Island, which is a ways north of there. And we're trying to understand the genetic connections between that population and these populations. So basically, there are no barriers to invasion of the, of the upper slope and the outer shelf. The summertime, sea surface temperatures have increased, as we said, a degree in the last 50 years. And within the next few decades, the, it will be warm enough, even in the shallowest portions of Antarctica, right near shore, it'll be warm enough for these crabs so they will not pass out and die because of their magnesium issue. So every time we make one of these predictions, we think, oh, we're just, you know, making this stuff up. We're going to be embarrassed. Every time we make a, con a prediction of, of some sort having to do with this thing, it happens faster than we predicted. And, and so it's just boom, boom, boom. Things are happening very rapidly. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I want to tell you another story also about invasive crabs. And that is that it's not only happening from below, it appears to be happening from across. And that is to say, there appear to be crabs, or maybe crabs, starting to come in from southern South America in very shallow water environments. And where they seem to be coming in, or at least what we think they're going to start coming in, is here. This is Deception Island, this toilet seat-shaped volcanic caldera. And uh, it is an interesting place. And it's interesting because it's geothermally heated, for one thing, nice and toasty. And it's also interesting because tourist ships are in there all day, every day. And tourist ships and any other kind of ships are going to bring in larvae, and adults of crabs. I mean, ballast water, everybody knows. This is a huge concern. San Francisco Bay is, is just crawling with invasive species because of ballast water issues. Same thing appears to be going on here. And one of our colleagues found a crab. And it is one crab, a crab, this thing, Halicarcinus clonatus. That is a southern hemisphere crab. And it's, he found it at Deception Island, the perfect place to find it. And if you look at this is the same, same graph I showed you before, of magnesium levels, but without the, 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 uh, without the icons. If you look at where Halicarcinus shows up, it's one of those crabs that's able to flush out magnesium. So it's a prime candidate to invade cooler Antarctic environments. Now, this is a native to southern South America, but there is another crab. And I really don't care about this one because it just doesn't do a whole lot in Ant Antarctic or anywhere else. It's not a real strong interactor. It eats organic gunge on the bottom. But this thing, Carcinus minus, if you've ever worked up in the Northeast, in this country, you will know it as an invasive in the rocky intertidal places like Nahant in Massachusetts. It is a European crab. It is invasive globally. It's all over the southern hemisphere. It's all over the northern hemisphere. And it is also really urethermal. It's really able to get that magnesium out of there. And it is a potential invader. And it is sitting there in Australia. It's sitting there in southern South America, or at least has potential distribution down there. And it's ready to rock and roll and go to Antarctica. So this is the, the current distribution of Halicarcinus. So southern South America, and it's made it to all these peri-Antarctic islands, the Falklands, South Georgia, Macari, and Kerguelen, and then it's down here in Deception. And if you look at this one, it's slightly less able to do to, to flush out magnesium than Halicar Science was still quite good at it. And as it warms up, I would bet dollars to donuts it's going to be the second crab in there in shallow water environments. This is a strong interactor. These crabs have raised hell in the rocky intertidal 
in, uh, in, in the, the northeastern U.S. as well as in the west. Coast. They live in soft bottoms. They live in hard bottoms. They can live anywhere. They're really tough, and they are me. So I would look out for them next. So basically, these are the avenues of reinvasion. That's to say crabs at some point were kicked out, and now they're coming back. Well, warm, poor rings. Again, we talked about larvae. The Lesotho populations on the slope. Again, we don't know how long they've been there and what they did during glaciations. We don't know that yet, but certainly they can expand. They, they, they seem primed to expand up the shelf and then expanding ship traffic, bringing in invaders from southern South America and apparently from elsewhere in the world. So they're there. The king crabs are there. They may move up. A lot of shelf species, as it warms, they're going to get pushed further south along the peninsula. And as I said, eventually they're going to bang into the continent and they could go extinct if it gets too warm. And I don't think that that's an unrealistic pie-in-the-sky scenario. I'm talking about this century. I think that this century this stuff is going to start happening or it's going to be in full swing. Echinoderms are going to see a big jump in predation pressure because predators are going to start coming in from southern South America. And basically, reinvading predators are going to destroy the beautiful, endemic, unusual character of Antarctica. Not only the species are unusual, but the whole trophic structure is different from everywhere else in the world. Remodernize the, the, the Antarctic benthos and basically make it just like any other normal place around the world. So, so you know, we will be poorer, uh, let's just say uh, ethically and aesthetically poorer. There's, there's no commercial no commercial, uh, horrendous commercial thing I can tell you about this. This is about what you care about. If you care about this, this should be upsetting to you. So, you know, this, this almost seems, I'm almost you know, ashamed to say this, but, but, you know, this is what it's about. Local action, obviously we've got to deal with ballast water, but, and I never would have said this 10 or 15 years ago, giving these kinds of talks, I always thought science needs to be pure. That's just not right. I mean, we all have to be activists on climate change and carbon control. It's really important. If the local stuff is limiting, you can solve the global stuff. Local stuff is limiting. You can solve the local stuff. The global stuff is limiting. Duh, right? So you have to work on these, both of these problems simultaneously. And that's, there's, there's no other choice about it. And uh, you know, uh, if you think it's time to give up, you're wrong. This is the time to fight the, har the hardest. Uh, many people have said this. This is the first, the earliest I can, uh, I can trace it to a, uh, to a French poet and essayist who died in 1945, so he probably saw some pretty horrible stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and he said, trend is not destiny. And, and this is the thing that keeps me going. So I'm going to stop there, say thanks a lot, and do one more thing, which is to say, give a small commercial announcement, which is to say, I'm giving another talk tomorrow about something completely different, and it's going to be about polar bears, corals, and whether or not you can use the Endangered Species Act to fight against what we're talking about today, which is climate change. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so now I'll take a breath. <laughs> no question. Yeah, Brian. They could, sure. I mean, that's you know, uh, as temperatures get up above above the point where they're going to form icebergs, sure you could e expect that to happen. They're playing the conger eels. They're they're all kinds of of shell-crushing crabs as well as shell-crushing fish there. And so, you know, the real issue is right now is going to be transport. How do, you, how do, how do they get across the Drake, you know? And, and, and that's, you know, that is an impediment to fish, but I think less so to crabs because they can, you know, as larvae. But, you know, fish larvae, who knows? Yes, Ron. Patagonian toothfish. Yeah, yes, it is. It's huge. Pisivorous. It's, it's basically a barracuda. I mean, they, they're, they're like a barracuda. So they eat other fish. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> why, why, why? <laughs> Always why, why, why? How should I know? No, I, it, it's, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, you know, the easy answer, phylogenetic constraint. I don't know. Some of them can. Snow crabs, right? I mean, which I'm sure y you've had some experience with snow crabs. They apparently are able. That's a break year in crab. They live in the Chukchi Sea and a lot of other places at sub freezing temperatures. So they're apparently able to do it. So, you know, why didn't, uh, you know, why didn't, um, 
the notothenioids radiate into niches where they could sh crush shells. They have those beautiful antifreeze glycoproteins, but they don't crush shells. I don't know. It's just the way it worked out. Just, you know, not satisfying, but apparently correct, you know. Yeah. Well, pH declines, I think that the, well, there is some evidence right now that declining pH is, is, is actually eroding uh, gastropod shells. I mean, benthic gastropods. There's a lot of worry that, um, that pteropods are going to have a serious problem as these, these pelagic, pelagic uh, snails. There are two kinds. There are the shelled pteropods and the naked pteropods. The shelled ones have got, you know, they're, they're eroding as the, as the and, and not as able to make shells as the pH has declined. It's the, the naked ones eat the shelled ones and then they are eaten in turn by a lot of other things in the pelagic food webs. And so so I think that's the that's the, the, the biggest danger. And you know I'm sure that, that the impacts of acidification are are all over the place. You know, some things benefit, some things do poorly, you know. But one thing that's for sure is that is that the, the Southern Ocean and, and the other pole as well are are undersaturated, right? So, so I think that the impacts of acidification, are, you know, are going to be, you know, either either this is overlaid on that, or they, I mean, they're they're co-layered, right? Um, coral reefs are a different story. I think that on coral reefs, everybody's going way, way, way about ocean acidification. These corals are going to be fried before it even takes hold, and so so you know, uh, people are you know starting to come to realize that in the coral reef community. I think in, the, at the, at the, in these polar seas, it could be an enormous problem. Yeah. Well, those shots, those shots were of, of the modern modern seas, the, the, the nice picture I showed at the beginning, those are way up near shore and uh, you know, it, right, and, and those shots from the, from, from the, su the, you know, the, the camera vehicle are, are way, way offshore. It's just a very different, different thing. We, I mean, we're, not, we're just not there yet. I mean, we, just, we don't, we haven't, we, haven't seen, we haven't seen any really good evidence of predation. What we did do on this task was we, by which I exclude myself, but, but what uh, our, our team did was they actually were able to trap these crabs. They brought them up. So we've got 51 of these things. Uh, some of them have eggs. You know, they're, they're just, they're, I mean, it's a population. And so we're going to try to look at development times and, and, uh, and just, a, just some basic aspects of their biology. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to keep them alive long enough that we can start throwing prey at them and, and seeing what they actually eat. <laughs>